you. Welcome back to the latest edition of the Caribbean Beach Club. How are you, my friend? Um, yeah, I, I'm looking kind of bedraggled. Um, I kind of, I, people keep sending me these CBD creams and I thought my hair was dry and I thought, oh, I'll rub it into my hair. But I'm thinking maybe that was a bad idea. And maybe we should end this conversation. But um, well, I'm at least you're not bleeding this time. That's true. And, the, and I have to tell you, your reputation is spreading far and wide. I'm meeting fellow uh, uh, members of your audience and, and they're approaching me and saying, oh, say hi to Raul. And, uh, <laughs> so you're, 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 you're out there. Your footprint is, has encroached upon my territory. How dare you? In <laughs> yeah, see, you're, you're the rock star here, not me. <laughs> so listen, I, I want to reach out to you because you put out a tweet thread of which 90% of the people responded saying, I have no fucking idea what he's talking about. I thought it was really good, and I thought it would be great for you to talk about it and explain a bit about what your thought process, what you're thinking through with regards to the dollar, rates, and other stuff. Great. So to make that productive, Raul, because I think we're at our best when it's push and give and take and, and the rest, because left to my own devices, again, I mean, I mean, no one does a better pole dance than I do. I mean, I can, I can wiggle we talked if about you the wish. We don't want the <laughs> Um, so I don't want to just go off and do my flight of fantasy. Fancy, so we maybe we can we can take it in steps. But first and foremost, um, I have received a few emails since then saying, "Oh my God, dude! Like, gotta control your emotion. You're getting angry." And someone sent me an email saying, "Hey, I mean, at your age, you still got a, like you've got a good thirty years." I'm like, "Thirty years? I'm like, really? You're writing me? I'm like, I'm going to die? I mean, I'm time stamped to expire." And and so I think that needs a little bit of explanation. The um, I was all set, you know, using uh, you know this wonderful facility that you allow me to use to to interview a, a hedge fund manager that I respect, whose name will remain anonymous. His name doesn't really matter. But the thing was, you got to think this is this is a kid who's probably got a team of twenty managing billions of resources, and 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 like you do, like we sit there on our little islands in the in the in the ocean. Um, you know, I surf. I, I have so many things. You know, I, I you know, I'm presently um, a, an architect. I'm living in a work site. I'm, you know, I have, I have a lot of things. But I can get myself into warrior mode, yeah, where I have the audacity to go one on one with one of the world's great managers, someone who makes me think, um, and I don't. 100% agree with everything he says, but I, I, I'm in a position where I can put myself into a position where I can push back on these people, which is a long way of saying that arguably I'm a sociopath and, and arguably a lot of successful people are sociopaths. I mean, I know there's there's like a list of seven things and I'm for sure everyone can, can read one or two and go, yeah, I, I kind of get that. But when you kind of start at the first and you've ticked every single one and you're at the seventh, you're like, Oh shit! <laughs> so I'm a sociopath. Okay. okay. So what? So what was the bit that made you sociopathic? Is was it his view on the dollar? Is it the market's view on the dollar? Is it what? What is it that triggered the triggered the tweet in the first place? Aside from being stood up at the altar. Like I say, it's not really. I, I don't care if the the, the 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 guy was busy, you know, and good luck to him. You know, he's managing money, and, it's, and with the elections, it's, it can be twenty four seven. I've I've been in that kind of that rage of of the trading cloud. Um, the, the point was that I had, in switching over from surfing to warrior mode, if you will, I got clarity in my mind, and I've been carrying a lot of things for some time. I probably have, I've had an inventory of timelessness in my head for two months, but hitting warrior stage, suddenly, you know, it was the matrix, and I could see it. And so I, I sat down. Um, Presently, I have no kitchen. I'm juicing, and so I, I got I skinned a, a a lime and and then and some ice and some tequila. And I thought, right, okay, we're going to have fun, and it and it flowed. And I love the cadence which is produced by Twitter. You know that that discipline. I I had to take an H out of schmuck. Apologies, but you know there's only so many characters, and I think you got my drift. So really, so first and foremost, it's that. Okay, and then obviously the dollar has has been strong this year and the dollar lately has been weak this year. And 
Um, and like I said, my tweet is, is kind of on its ass just now. And there's somewhere around that, let's say 92 or so on the dollar index. And chart wise, you think, ooh, you know, if we lose there, you, you're going to be you're going to be 90, and then you're going to be knocking on kind of 85. And that ends up being a big, really a big move when you consider yeah. the normal volatility that, that supports these, these trading ranges. And so my question was, is that going to happen? And, and then that's when kind of all my kind of negative interest rates and the like. And, and of course, and good old look, uh, uh, Goldman or, or whatever, and, and his, his theories and, and the like. And so it all kind of came supercharged in my head. And I tried, I guess, to do a kind of a Jack Kerouac version of it. So I guess the principal point is that the exorbitant privilege, which the US is assumed to run, this, this ability to print money, which of course has been accentuated by what I prefer to call central bank propaganda as opposed to central bank action, uh, which is to say uh, the quantitative easing program of creating um, essentially surplus banking reserves that the banking community has very little desire to turn into uh, credit risk or loans. But they keep, and indeed Jay Powell during the height of the, the crisis when he was trying to kind of um, give out a message to you know the, the, the good, ordinary, working folk of America saying, hey, the, we're, we got your back, we're doing something. And he was kind of fibbing, he was a bit kind of, you know, liar, liar, pants on fire, because he, he was saying, he said, we're printing money. You can kind of see it from M2, right? But the money comes from the Fed, and then it doesn't really go anywhere. It gets stuck in the banks, and Europe's the same. I looked at, by the way, I looked at M2 in all the major countries around the world. Every single one of them, um, velocity of money, every single one of velocity of money is below one, except the United States, which is at 1.2, which is barely, but every one of them. So any dollar goes in, less comes out. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Initially, of course, um, in, and by initially, I want to say um, the sort of April, May rolling data as it came in, um, there seemed to be a surge. Um, and, the, and there was a surge, but it's this, it's, it's this surge of fant fantastically silly behavior, which is um, Procter & Gamble can, can raise like $5, 10000000000 billion at, at nothing. And people are desperate to engage with that kind of lending. You know, it's, it's, it's meaningless. And um, Procter & Gamble are incentivized to do it because there are very, 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 very dark moments when even they can't access credit. So so why not? But again, this lending, which is not going into productive or even unproductive speculation, it's just sitting there in bank vaults. So we had an initial, hey, they're printing money. And, hey, the M2 thing looked as if annualized it's running at 25%. But what do we see now? And Behind, again, behind the, the magician's curtain, I want to say in August, I, I had the, the great honor of presenting to a credit union uh, in, um, in the northeast of the United States to the, to the directors. Like I say, I, I, I tap dance. Um, but what I didn't know was that as part of the emergency COVID, pre not precautions, but kind of like state of, you know, state of play, was that banks are not allowed to repossess and banks are not allowed to share credit records or credit history from their peer group. So, which is quite remarkable. So um, you have bankers who are, who are fearful of the credit, that it, the credit risk that exists in the economy. Why are, they, why are they fearful? They're fearful because largely for the last 10 years, we've been in a, a, a form of depression that doesn't dare reveal itself, but it's there. I want to say, for ordinary households, the last 10 years kind of probably wouldn't be that different from the period 1934 to 1937-38. If we ignore John Steinbeck novels of the, of the, the Dust Bowl, the, the Dust Bowl, you know, the profound, not only the economic, but you know, weather patterns and, and over farming and the lack of understanding about nitrogen fertilizer, um, you know, the, the, the complete uh, tragedy. And that's the kind of brown, grainy images we have of the Great Depression. But 34 to 38, kind of people got on with their, it was a, it was drudgery, if you will. And that's how I have described um, the last 10 years. So that's, it's a depression which no one talks about. And that's what's making risk takers fearful of risk. It's why we're getting this bifurcation in 
credit markets in that if you have very little credit risk, then you are apportioned an astonishingly rich valuation. There's literally no upper bound to the price that people are willing to pay for safe custody during a depression. And of course, it's antithesis is if you're an airline stock, a retailer, a whatever, yeah, then you might find that your share price is trading at where it was in 1982. You know, this, this is a market of, of two extremes, okay? So in that environment, can you imagine you then take the bank, you say, I'm going to blindfold you, okay? You're, I'm not going to give you any credit information. Now, I, and, and I'm going to give you lots of reserves. Go, go and lend money. <laughs> it's, it's never going to happen. No, and, you know, it's a structural problem also because the banks in Europe don't lend anymore. The, and they don't really use the bond market as much. The US has stopped lending money. You look at the, the loan officers survey, they've stopped lending money. And that's pretty much happening all around the world. So as you say, it is a bit of a magician's trick that they're claiming that the printing is helping everybody out. It's not. You look at the numbers, it's basically sitting on the bank's balance sheets. That's it. But we have this propaganda that they're printing and it's inflaming people. And, and so back to this notion of this exorbitant privilege, hey, you know, and Luke gets really kind of, hey, and he's, he's out there, hey, you know, the, you know, the dollars. And we even had a piece, um, you know, Brent Johnson forwarded the uh, Ken Rogoff piece, hey, dollars due to take another leg down. And I was like, really? Really? Because they're printing all this money? Again, really? And so actually I started looking at trying to deconstruct it. And I find that the privilege is actually, the privilege has been handed over to the other side, to the mercantilist nations of, of essentially Europe, of Southeast, Southeast Asia, okay? Um, and they will not permit the dollar to devalue, okay? Because if we were to go to 140, you know, the euro dollar rate was to go to 140, you know, where is the European economy going in that? Where, where is your GDP assumption, right? Yeah, it blows up. Yeah. Bleak. Okay. So, and and what and the, the trail path has been set by the Swiss central bank. And I got paid. Hey, if I was them, I would do exactly the same thing. They actually do print the fiat currency. And with the fiat currency, they buy dollar assets, be it shares in Amazon, be it gold, or be it treasuries. They're all the same. They're denominated in dollars. Okay. And therefore, it's the it's the willingness, it's the ability, it's the mandate of all of those global central banks to react individually, but collectively to print their fiat, to sell their fiat, to buy dollar, which I believe is denying the US the opportunity to have a devaluation. It wasn't no. all the other central banks action. So everybody is basically mercantilist. They're all trying to sell more of their own currency. And the net result is they're always buying dollars in one way, shape or form. So whatever the U.S. tries to do to lower its currency, you know, because everyone talks about the rate differentials or growth or whatever, it doesn't seem to work. I mean, I've noticed this for a long time. The dollar still either stays here, chops around or goes up, but it doesn't go down. Exactly. It's a dirty time series which doesn't do a lot. And that's most likely to continue. So, But if I was the, if I was the U.S., I'd be like, hmm. Before we go into this, why should the U.S. want to lower their currency? I think that's the that's a key thing people need to understand, and then we can go into the mechanisms. And, and of course, the the antithesis of that question is why does the rest of the world want to be mercantilist? Okay, so and it's just a model. You know, the rest of the world feels, and perhaps, and for sure, in some parts of the world, there is a there is still a comparative advantage, and for sure, there's a comparative advantage with. The remain be closer to seven than say five, you know, for those countries to pr produce things. One of the things I looked at, Hugh, is I wrote a, a piece in GMI over the weekend, is this mercantilist kind of activity around debasing, not debasing, but kind of lowering your, your currency came out of the WTO agreement in 96. Because when you equalize tariffs, how do you compete? Price. Yes. Yeah. No, no I, I, absolutely. And um, I remember, how, how long have we had the fix on the Hong Kong dollar peg? <laughs> it's a long, long time. It's a long, long time. So they want to produce things. The US 
up until Trump, uh, and we'll see the direction. But you know, given the representation of the Republican Party in the elections, you have to think it, it, it re- something remains in the sense of you know the the kind of make America better by kind of trying to have less hollowing out, less less of so the, the fight against mercantilism. Yeah. So, but it's kind of like so just now. I would say that we've actually pushed too far in favoring the mercantilists. And it was it was kind of okay because the US still had a balance sheet that it could tap in terms of it could leverage further. You know, since the since Richard Branson bought Necker Island. Um, let's take it, let's take it to the source. Uh, Richard Branson of Virgin Cream nailed the bottom of the debt cycle, which had begun with the bankruptcy of the US banking sector in the early 1930s. And, and with that unnecessary bankruptcy, but you know, we had central banks who were ideological zealots back then. And as a result, we had a bankruptcy of the banking system. And the message from on high and for, from all of us in society was, you got to get your act together. You got to stay, stop taking these stupid risks and you got to deleverage. Okay, and the U.S. economy went from let's say three times debt to GDP, and when Tricky Dicky was buying Necker Island, we were roughly about 1.3 times. So it had taken 40 years, and we had deleveraged to the tune of two times GDP in terms of the outstanding debt, a debt quantity. And in that environment, you know, a Scottish laird wants to sell his island for a million bucks, and Richard says, "A hundred thousand, maybe," and they they shake on 150. You know, that's the opportunities that do not present themselves to us today. That was 40 <laughs> years ago. Okay. Okay. So the problem with the mercantilist model today and the problem for the U.S. is a willingness to accept it is that at four and a half times debt to GDP, there ain't a lot of desire to take on more. So there's one thing, hey, we take your jobs but we, we put an extra zero on your credit card balance. It's okay. That kind of thing, the, the climax of that was 2006, okay? And, of course, the, the savage housing market decline then rolled us into this nameless depression that I'm talking about. So that's kind of – that takes us where we are today. It's stalemate. Nothing's, nothing's happening because they're still pursuing mercantilism. They're still kind of pushing dollars. Like, they're pushing – their savings to the U.S. and saying, have fun, a bit like the, the Fed. The mercantilists are like the Fed. The Fed's turning to the banks and saying, this one's on us, guys. Like, here's seven trillion. I'm looking that way. Norm, I'm your regulator. <laughs> Normally, I'm on your ass, but I'm looking that way. Here's seven. Have fun. Have a party. The parents are out of the building. And, and the kids are like, no, 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 I'm doing my homework. And it's the same with the mercantilists. Hey, look, we're looking the other way. We're buying treasuries. They're, they're egregiously overvalued, but we don't care. Have the money. Just buy something. Buy anything. We don't care. But that's not happening. So that's the inertia. Um, and that's the failure to escape, to, to get that velocity to escape the inertia that we found ourselves in for the best part of 12 years. So why does the US want the weaker currency now? Why is it, why should it start thinking, you know what, if we can lower the value of the dollar, it's going to solve us problems. Is it because the US needs to export its way out? Or does, what, what is it? Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a that, thank you. you. You've teed me up and I found coherency from the CBD oil growing through <laughs> my, my hair. In a typical adult lifetime, you might experience three or four recessions, yeah? But you could spend all of your duration on planet Earth and have the great good fortune of missing a depression, which is to say they're very, thankfully, they're very rare occurring events. And I kind of tried to hit upon this in, in my thread that the really the, the first business cycle depression, depressions prior to, let's call it 1830, a bit early, 1825 or so, but prior to that had been a function of famine, crop failure, uh, um, and the idiots, the, the sovereign leadership, the kings and, and their, their petty wars and, and, and you know, wanton uh, destruction of mankind. Okay, that's that's and as a, as the ordinary guy, you kind of periodically you you took one, you know. Um, 
in the 1830s, you're like, you've lost your job. Your neighbor's lost your job. If you got a job, you've had to take a huge haircut. Like you don't have enough. You're kind of the kids are begging on the street. And you're like, okay, we didn't invade France or Spain. <laughs> the last time I looked, the crops were fine. What gives? Okay. And what I had given was that after the, the in financing the, the UK's victory over uh, Napoleon and, and the like, <laughs> we had come off the gold standard. And the, and the London central banks really, you know, the kids had a party. And they, they kind of went, whoa, hey, there's this big place called America. And, and they started funding uh, transport bonds, canal bonds. Um, and, and they discovered shady characters in, in South America. And sovereigns never go bankrupt until they do. And the UK did come back onto the gold standard. And, and of course, there was, a, there was a cycle of exuberance which led to its inverse. And so London banks were pulling in credit and, and they were the center and they were pulling it in from all corners of the globe and, and creating this new strange thing called a business, a deep business cycle of depression. Okay. Now, and it was nasty. You know, it's, it's why we get Les Miserables and you know, it, it, it impacted on cultures where we get Engels and Marx saying, oh, you know, we, it's now time to redistribute off with their heads, you know. That didn't come to pass, partly owing, again, to the constant of human ingenuity. But I want to say it was terminated by, by finding um, a looseness in policy, which was sufficient in degree to kind of push people back. To I remember, I'm all about psychology. To change the psychology from fear and just get some curious minds going, ooh, those canal ponds look kind of cheap. What, what was the monetary innovation? One in innovation was the discovery of the substantial Californian gold fields. And yeah, at the time we were on a dual, where are we on a dual standard? I'm not sure, but you know, the, we, we kind of moved back and forth between uh, silver and gold. And so gold becoming more plentiful allowed banks to extend credit. You know, And like I said, people are like, wow, yeah, no, that this conditions are now they're sufficiently loose, but I kind of want to have a go. And I'll keep it short in the next. The second time around was characterized um, by uh, William Jennings Bryan and his run for the United States presidency. Uh, he ran twice uh, in the 1890s. He ran against the backdrop of um, a, a, the second failure. Again, London banks lending too much money. And this time it was very much to, to railroad bonds and again, very much to shady. South, South American governments. Um, and that kind of, we had 20 years, and that's that's the Wizard of Oz. That's the kind of the wicked witch of the East is these banks that keeps calling in the money, and it's the, the, the poor factories which are shuttering and closing. And that's what William Jennings was um, standing, his platform was, we're being crucified on a cross of gold, you know, and the yellow brick broad and Dorothy she wore in the book she wore silver slippers and i was like hey let's go let's bring silver's really plentiful let's ditch gold and let's go back to silver and let's have that monetary response remarkably he was ignored but that depression came to an end because a scotsman who cares he could have been russian he could have been whatever but a scot scottish engineer just had the breakthrough in terms of leaching with cyanide to to extract gold from the South African deposits, yeah? And again, that was the most gigantic expansion in money supply, and we were back and off to the races. So I want to say to you that we have had few depressions, thankfully, and their remedy has been a kind of out of the blue monetary, a kind of, who would have thought that? Who would have thought that? Um, uh, discovery. Now, I'm not suggesting we're going to discover gold on Mars or Moon or whatever. I think it, it's more um, mundane than that. I think actually that the reserve currency imposing like a 300 basis point negative charge on the surplus redundant savings in its economy would be the equivalent of, in, of creating Klondike fever. I think that's the thing that could unlock this, okay? And so we don't need the dollar to be weak. Um, and, and, and it's not an option which is feasible or available, okay? But there is one knocking on the door, so to speak, which is um, innovation in, um, 
in the Fed's response to depressions. And so you're the innovation, and it seems to me that Occam's raise it because it's pretty bloody straightforward. You just go massively negative. And what happens is the dollar weakens, the banks turf out all of the money that's sitting in their vault saying, hey, we don't want this stuff. Let's give it to people. And people who are holding dollars say, we don't really want to hold this any longer because it's a bit costly. I'll do something else with it. Is that the kind of idea here? And money gets flooded back, back into the system and not hoarded. It, it, it is. I, it, but I would maintain that the dollar doesn't weaken. Again, the dollar, it, it can't. There's, there's, there's no limit. We, what's after a trillion? Who cares? But, you know, there's no limit to the Swiss banks. I, I did a thing on Instagram and I had a picture of it. You know, the, again, the, the murky brown, grainy image of the desperately unfortunate German citizen with a wheelbarrow of, of banknotes going to, to buy food. Yeah, I'm going to buy a, a loaf of bread. Um, and my point is, like, I'm, I'm going to show you something shocking. This thing here, this, this thing is an iPhone. Okay. Think of the, think of the number of, it's un, I, I'm sure someone will correct me that, that there is a limit to zeros that, uh, in terms of currency that I could put on this phone, right? And I would just, with a term, I go, bing, okay, bing, bing. So there's no limit to the monetary digital printing press response to the US yeah, uh, move towards 300 uh, minus basis points, okay? And again, 300 minus basis points, you know, the, the models, I'm not a great believer in, in models, but you know, the, the old looking at inflation, looking at the output gap, kind of seeing where the interest rate should be, kind of does typically come round about those levels, you know? And you know, if you went that way and you had minus 300 at the short end and you were minus 100 at the long end, 10 years out or seven years average maturity, it kind of would all start making a little bit of sense, you know. So really my point is more, again, that I, I still believe that central banks have been shorn of ideology. Now, in its replaced, they have yet to find wisdom. On the other hand, people like us, our competitors, are the ideologues. And, and pretty much the roles have swapped and pretty much most of the people watching this will be thumb downing me because they want to be me in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. I was a miserable curmudgeon. You know, I had the foresight to see the crisis. I could see the idiotic behavior of my peer group. And I wanted to purge the system. I wanted to put them in prison. I wanted to give them lifetime bans. I, I wanted to eliminate them. And the, and the Fed thankfully said, take cute, look, yeah. um, take more CBD oil, calm, 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 okay? And they said, because because that that road, you know, this people that say, we you 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 solve this by putting interest rates up. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you I don't, don't. Believe, never believe that argument. People say, well, the Fed have abnormally lowered the rate. I don't think they actually have. If you there's a regression against demographics, and it's basically where it should be. Now, the, I mean, the, the interesting question is, is because I say I think the Fed goes negative and I think the markets take them there first. But you're pushing that discussion even a bit further, saying not only negative, but historically massively negative in a way that is disruptive to everybody's ideology. And and that's kind of, I, I, again, one of my tweets, God, I wish I'm quoting myself, which is... Um, uh, unforgivable, um, and, and I'm, I've got a terrible memory, but I was kind of saying that I feel like myself as a macro mind, I've spent this century a bit like the USSR did the last century, like in denial, like our rules just don't work. So, it's a, so basic, and maybe it's just a false set of rules that we all cling to. These are rules, the, you know, the zero lower bound. Well, guess what? The fucking Bank of England went negative. Well, they're about to go negative, but UK interest rates have been negative now. First time in 500 years. This could never happen, but it does. But it does. And it therefore does. our rule book is wrong. Yeah. And then again, let's, but let's kind of, so take it from theoretical, fanciful flights of fancy to the, to the grim reality of today. And, and again, where we create imagined realities, which I don't think really accord with 
action on the ground. So interest rates are really low. And like you said, the Fed's at zero. And we've got some central banks which are actually negative. Funny thing is, when I go to borrow, okay, and I borrow in euros. So at first blush, this is going to sound fantastic. And, and I went, whoa. Um, I got to borrow fixed at 2% for 20 years. And I go, wow. But dig further and it's like, well, the 2%, they were screwing me because with market rates, it should have been, and with and risk added on, maybe I should have paid between 100 and 200, uh, one, 120 basis points, not 200. There was 80 of kind of, thank you very much, you know, drop the soap. Um, but worse than that is the need to amortize the loan that I So 20 years, effectively, I'm paying five, repaying 5% of this debt outstanding each year, which to say that my cash flow uh, is minus 7%, 2 plus the 5. I've got to find 7%. I so I borrowed 5 million. Right? I've got to find 7% of 5 million. And I'm, tr- I'm, tr- I'm presently doing up, a, a, like rebuilding a house. I want, I want to do two or three at the same time. I can. I can. No. And again, where this is ridiculous, and I, okay, kind of having my cake and eating it, but um, because I, and by that I mean, I believe that 10-year treasuries are somewhere between a range of, 65 basis points and 85 basis points because the U.S. private sector banking community is not taking the $7 trillion and lending it, not taking the, the quantitative easing money and lending it. I think that explains why we're at market rates. Others disagree and say it's the Fed is buying. Okay, so let's take that argument. If the Fed's actions are actually, it's like Atlas and the Fed's like, don't worry, don't, don't worry, I, I, got, I got your back. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold these collateral values. In fact, I think, gee, I think I can push them higher. Yeah, yeah, they're going higher. What's, so the Fed's got your back, okay? What's the point of insisting that you have to repay? Give bullet loans. You know, just, you know, in 20 years' time, I know that my property in St. Paul's with the Fed, like Atlas, right? My property value is going to be like 1.5x minimum what it is today. So, just allow me to pay the interest component, okay? Because the Fed is doing a good, if you will, the central banks around the world are supporting the asset value. So rather than just an asset value which makes rich people feel richer, but they don't go out and consume it, give it to people. And okay, I'm not necessarily representative, but I would spend it. You know, give it to people, make that holding or supporting or pushing, elevating higher asset values, make it click into real decisions which would allow me to employ more plumbers more electricians more carpenters more lawyers more accountants etc my argument with that is all well and good without something like a central bank digital currency that allows us to direct it in certain ways it just goes into the stock market which is not doing anybody anything if you said here you you can have a loan for one percent interest bullet payment 20 years has to go into property and you have to invest in the building of it. Okay, fair enough. That's a good bet if you want to take that bet. But right now it doesn't happen. So if the Fed were to go to negative 2%, just a bunch of rich people buy equities and get richer. How does, um, how does, it, how does it become a better mechanism then? Which is why I'm very interested in the digital currency route because you can change policy on different people. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm still a little bit suspicious on digital. It just sounds trendy. I mean, you can just put a mandate to uh, loan offices across the yeah, United States. You know, you and Richard Werner exactly. talked about this, right? Yeah, you lose your license if you don't don't play, then lose your license. But, so it can be, but that's uh, you know, semantics. So digital or central banking kind of, uh, you know, being kind of tough and, and mandating this. Um, and again, that takes you to Richard's point that then you can actually try and direct it to the least offensible, the most re- uh, reward. I still think there are rewarding investments that you can do, you can make today in the global economy. I think it's just been written off by a general kind of uh, nihilism or, or the like. But the key to this and the key to the negative rates, um, which we haven't discussed, is you need profitable banks. Okay, So that's why I was saying in my, my paper that the, the Federal Reserve, we talk about yield curves and inversions and the like. First and foremost, the central bank is the, re- the banking regulator of domestic banks in the United States. And as a regulator, it should say, we're doing this uh, and it's being passed on immediately. 
And it's and you know what we give you, I think you get deposit insurance up to about at least a hundred thousand dollars. So um you know, what kind of gonna charge for that now? Like if, if you actually have I don't know if it's a hundred thousand or two hundred and fifty thousand, there's a figure out there whereby you can say, Hey folks, if you're kind of sufficiently comfortable, if you're the type that got two hundred and fifty thousand spare dollars sitting in your bank account earning kind of zero, you know what? We're going to charge you three percent, okay? And then the banks are going to bring down their lending rates, but they're going to get. I, I want to get a higher, fatter margin, and the, and the profitability of the banks is going to be taken, and it's going to be paid for by the creditor community. The credit. There's two parts of the and, economy, and you can still have a two hundred and fifty basis point steep curve as well. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So you can still because you need profitability because the key to this is fostering a change in psychology. I want banks to be greedy, not fearful. Does it? In terms of society, hates banks. Okay, so, uh, banks were happy, cheerful people who gave you loans between 2000 and 2006, regardless if you committed adultery, you know, if you had been in prison, if you had been a serial bankruptor. They're like, just take the money, right? And we still castigated banks. Normally, we castigate them because they don't give us the money. So we don't like banks. Let's just, just deal with that. The system works when banks are profitable. So let's assume that we're now in this new, I want to live in this world a little bit. So we're going to live yeah. in this negative 300 basis point world, right? So I'm Society General. I say, Hugh Hendry, I'm going to lend you, lend you 5 million bucks at 10 basis points. I've got a 300 basis point margin on that because I'm getting it from the central bank at negative 300. Yeah. You're paying no interest and a bullet payment, right? That's, so that's like the opportunity of a lifetime. What happens to the pension funds and everybody else who needs cash? What do they do in this situation? Well, pencil, pension funds, but we've got to be, I've got to be careful because I was going to launch into a tirade there. Um, because again, what I want to kind of, again, put out there is that We've had a cycle, a 50-year cycle, again, kind of related to that deleveraging and then re-leveraging. Yeah. Um, and it's a cycle which favors kind of the, the last cycle has favored creditors over debtors. So it's, it's favored, if you will, Saudi Arabia, right? Right. Random, an act of, you know, an act of randomness that on, a, on its territory, it had these oil reserves. Um, and it has no ingenuity. No, no cultural ability to transform that into ways of changing the world on their own, which is fine. We'll give them a pass for that. Um, but they, they, they put it, they go into the genius of our market economy and they say, hey, we're creditors. We've got a ton of money, but few ideas about what to do with it. And we then engage them with people who've got like the, the Steve Jobs of this world, you know, the square pegs and the right. I'm going to change the world. I just need, I need, I need. Bingo, bingo. Okay. Now, we've had an egregious over distribution to the Saudi, not to personalize Saudi Arabia, but to the Saudi Arabia, to the creditor, and particularly the creditor sovereign nations of the world. Uh, which is to say that when we came in and we did this rent transfer um, or the imposition of, of, a, of a, a tariff to access that credit, um, we were overpaying. We were overpaying, which is to say you've been overcompensated for being a creditor for the last 40, 50 years, which is why. Assets are, are this price, okay? In the old model, capital made all the money here, right? Anybody with money made money. Anybody who needed money didn't. And that's why today we, we well, that's why that's why we had Brexit. That's why we had Trump. That's why Trump is still <laughs> about to be booted out. But, you know, he got 70 million Americans to vote for it because of that power, okay? And so we're tr like, as we live in this imagined reality of what might come to pass, we're trying to find it now this 70 million people that feel disenfranchised by the last 40, 50 years. And we're trying to say, hey, listen, you know, I can make a difference because all you, if we sat, China and, and, and the ilk saddled you with debts. Amazon persuaded, have you seen that? When I look in the cupboards and I see the junk that I buy from Amazon, I mean, what gets into my head? But, you know, like we've persuaded you to take on this debt, to buy this junk, okay? And, you, and now you've just got to keep paying it to the man. We're from the government, and really, actually, this time we're here to help. You know those monthly payments? They're going to go to zero. Right? This one, this one's on us. This one's for you. 
So what we're trying to do, because remember, whilst the 10-year rate is at 75, 80 basis points, right? whilst you know, Japan's got negative 20 basis points, um, et cetera, in the real world that we live in, credit is, is hard to get. Credit card rates, all-time record highs. They're above where they were in 1990 when interest rates were at 6 or 7%. So, yes, credit is not – it's a bifurcated market. The haves can borrow all the money they want. As you said, Procter & Gamble, at any size, at any price, negative interest rates. Somebody else, the high street shop that's closing down right now, zero chance. So there you go. So what I'm seeing, what I'm suggesting to you is that we give everyone the Procter & Gamble edge. And I get that. But what I can't see through in this theoretical yeah. world of the future is – what do Procter & Gamble do? Or what, what happens to leverage in terms of GDP? We'll talk about some other impacts in a bit, but what happens to, to leverage with the unnecessary players taking even more leverage? That may call upon uh, your insight with, with the digital, and that may call upon the, the wisdom of you know, the princes of the yen with Richard Werner to say, um, there is a market-based pricing, market-based coming together of creditor and debtor agents it's, it's a wonderful system. It's rewarded us, but we can still improve it. Why did these PPP loans or whatever they were, why did that not work? Because wasn't that this, really? And I don't know the ins and out mechanism, and neither of us live in the US, but but the reality was they said small to medium size enterprises, here's as much money as you need. And no, but, didn't... no, the problem was that the, the Fed's uh, mandate from the 1936 Fed Act or whatever um, doesn't allow uh, those debts to be written off. like So you can walk away. The, the Fed would be on your case until you went to your grave. It was a perpetual liability that you couldn't absolve via the usual kind of bankruptcy. I think someone can correct me on that, but that's what I... It was It was the hardest loan to renege on. So as part of your theoretical new world, you need somebody to not ask for their money back at the end. I, well, what happens with no, the bullet payment? Or yeah. Assets but no one wants the money. You only want the money back at the end because there's uh, to make up for the shortfall in the perceived or the anticipated rise or stabilization of the asset value. And if the central bank's there, Atlas holding the damn thing high, no one wants the money back. So, so then the theoretical other discussion in all of this that I'm kind of interested in as well is why not just do a $10 trillion perpetual note? You know, a perpetual bond at two percent inflate the whole thing out do 10 trillion dollars or 20 trillion whatever the ridiculous number is and maybe all the countries around the world do it at the same time isn't that also down the same route i understand it's not directly for the person yeah, yeah. But that's another no, way I, of looking at it oh i mean the, you know the, j just take the 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 the, fisc, the u.s fiscal program uh, from march april of this year i mean did it really make a difference? Did it really move uh, the dial? What if that money instead, well, how much was that? Was it $3 trillion? Yeah. yeah, and maybe $300 billion of it was a check to people in the post. So 10%, really, that's all. But what if they'd taken the $3 trillion or $10 trillion, to use your figures, and just said, you know what, this is a buffer. Like, we've got, like, to the banking sector, we know you're scared. We get it. Um, you're legitimately scared because we haven't had your back and we've let this thing drift too long. We've been stuck, you know, like it was only like two, three years ago, the Fed was raising rates like, and they've now apologized for that. And the next line is to say, hey, stop apologizing. You do something about it. OK. And you say, he, like, here's this big, here's this additional equity. Your equity today, you've got to eat through three or ten trillion dollars, right, before you hit your equity again. Go and, go and multiply. What yeah. you're doing is giving free collateral to the market and then say, borrow against this. But it would have to be prescribed with some kind of mandate um, against egregious um, land speculation. I think at that point, you would really have to insist you know, back to the, the model of to, to fund the, the construction of a new house, but um, to buy an existing and then just to feed higher and higher asset price in terms of people passing houses between themselves seems a, a bad i think we can we can work out a form of regulation that would prevent that i, I know um, i'm, yeah, I'm I think, glad to say i keep that company 
Because, you know, the, I, I don't think there are any right answers. There's ones that are less wrong. And I think people live on this ideology that there is a correct answer that the central bank should do. But if you and I had to sit down at the Federal Reserve, if, if they invite us and say, right, well, you guys are going to run this for a few weeks, and you've talked about this, I mean, we'd look at ourselves and go, well, I don't know what to do. It seems a mess. I can raise interest rates, the world crumbles, cut interest rates to, to zero, to negative. I don't know, maybe it blows up the pension system. I'm going to give money directly. Maybe it creates inflation. I mean, there's not many good outcomes in this. So it's trying to find pragmatic answers that aren't driven by ideology, I think. But then that's that's why you get the logjam, because you, you use the word pragmatic. There's, there's nothing pragmatic you know so what we forget because the distance of time has has dulled um our our memory banks paul volcker was a crazy mother <laughs> yeah, i mean we forget with the distance of time this guy it's literally like um a cowboy movie and this sheriff walks in you know kicking 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 you know the bar door the salon the two doors swing open and it's like hey guys you know there's gonna be change around here and like <laughs> who's the dude in the decks <laughs> and he's like and, and they all turn around and they drink more tequila and he's like no you you ain't hear me you ain't hear me and boom you know so what what is boom like the recession your grandfather's recessions the 1970s your kind of movement in nominal gdp from peak to trough was big i mean we really got big nominal gdp contractions you know? and of course uh, Volcker came in after the big one, you know, the one with the initial oil price uh, shock. But he came in on the cusp of the second. So we, we knew the first one was diabolically bad. We were coasting and, and like coming, the wave was coming down and we knew what that was going to bring. And this guy's like, Ting! I'm going to raise rates, 100 basis points. Anyone want to play? And he does it. He does it on a Saturday. Who does it on a Saturday? On a Saturday. Can't wait until the market opens. He was insane. All right. And why was he doing it? Because the banks had be, had become awash with Saudi Arabia. I keep mentioning Saudi Arabia. They'll probably they'll be diced to pieces in the embassy and saying, well, the, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the oil money, the, this, the surplus creditor flow of money, which eff effectively created the euro dollar market. We haven't even discussed euro. Euro dollar is like this invisible offshore you dollar banking system, which is like arguably two to three times even bigger than U.S. banks, and we just pretend it doesn't exist. It's the, this dark web. Anyway, all of that money is like, hey, well, you know, we're flush and we're, we're, we're making loans to Paraguay and we're making loans to Argentina, and but we're making loans to loans to mom and pop shops or whatever, you know, businesses and enterprise. The one thing we're not doing, you know, banks are a hedge fund. Banks are the most simple hedge fund conceived ever. They only have. One decision, do you lend to the government or do you lend to, to you and I? Yeah? And back when Volcker came in, it's like, well, we're lending to, to the public, you know, because it's inflation protected. And Volcker's like, you're making a big mistake. And so he raised rates several times and just made the recession even more ferocious in order because he had to change psychology from greed to fear. He's like, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a recession. You're going to buy government bonds yielding 12%. So we forget all of that. So when you said, you know, why aren't they doing pragmatic, practical things? That's that, We're talking the opposite. We want them to be crazy. Do crazy stuff. Well, I'm not sure. Well, pr pragmatic to me means independent of idea, ideology. Mm. I think that's what Volcker did, right? He just said, I've got this problem and this is the way I'm going to solve it. And what you're saying, I think, is the is the same thing, but the opposite way around, which is, well, if Volcker went to 18%, we go to negative five or negative three. And is that going to change the dynamics of the economy and get us out of this long-standing depression? So, and it, and it did, you know, so radical, courageous, not, not, uh, radical in the context of it's not been done before. Like we've not had a Fed kind of push to those kind of limits. Um, uh, but it was necessary because we had to change the behavior of very important economic participants. I think it changes the behavior of the foreign 
creditors who put their money in the US, right? All of these, the mercantilists, I think it would change them. I think if you, as you said, regulate it in some way to make sure it goes into the hands of certain people, it does that. The only problem is, and this is where the argument will be in the comments section below, is anybody who's a saver will say, fuck you, Hugh. I'm the best thing. I'm, I'm the biggest Christmas stocker you're ever going to get for Christmas. Right? Why? If you're, six, if you're my mum, who's 78 years old, and Hugh Hendry decides in all his majesty to wa wave his wand, cut her, her interest rates to, I mean, they're at zero now. She lives in Spain. And you're going to say, no, Mrs. Powell, I'm going to take 5% off you every year. She's not going to be happy. And there's still quite a lot of voters. Don't How do you care. avoid that? <laughs> I, I, I'm like, you know what? I don't care. First of all. <laughs> right, um, I'm going to get mum on the phone. You can speak to her. You know, go and buy Philip Morris shares. All right, you know, go and buy shares in the bank. Which, okay, look, you know, so the, the bank's now screwing you. They're not screwing your mother. That's that all just gets just too visceral and, and whatever. But <laughs> this oil stuff's really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> You've got stocks like make the high dividend yielding stocks safe. That's what you're doing. Okay. You don't have to have your, it's only convention that you have your money in the bank. It's, and, and, and more than that, it's inertia. So, how do I call my mum up? Because the Spanish banks did this, oddly enough, in 2012. They went, well, instead of these savings accounts, we've converted them for you into preference shares. <laughs> And then they Thanks said, very much. oh, by the way, we can't pay the preference shares. <laughs> Everybody took a massive haircut and the Spanish banks kind of laughed their way. Well, exactly. They got away with it. You, so the, the history of banking is um, consistent and profoundly bad behavior. Okay, They get away with it because we are too preoccupied doing interesting things with our life to phone the bank. You might send one email, but then it's like another email. It doesn't. I've got one friend who just goes straight to the chief executive of giant companies, but everyone else just takes it. And I guess there is a life raft, whether it's gold or Bitcoin or whatever you choose, there are life rafts. So if you've got cash and you don't want to participate in the borrowing economy. So is this, in, I guess this is the thing that's going to be on everybody's minds. It's going to be screaming at the screen saying, but this is going to be the big inflation. And you're probably saying, yeah, and that's the point. You get rid of all the debt. The number one purpose of quantitative easing was higher interest rates to deal with higher inflation. That you will, will know policies are working when actually when rates go up because we've got inflation and then we can deal with it, if you will. As is, you know, I throw that out. So people have just got to remember that what we're trying to do, you know, we're scuttle butting or something. We're, we're kind of, we're, we're taking hot potatoes and trying to, you know, like rather than just this ideology that says no, it's like, Ooh. That's a boring conversation. Let's let's consider it more. Yeah, like grandmothers and stuff. We sent young men to their death. We still do with international conflict. This is real. People are. Yeah, but the baby are, boomers have never taken it on the chin. They've had it all on a silver platter and screwed it for everybody else. That's why I I, I really don't care. Really don't care. I, <laughs> I I and I really don't care. As as long as I'm looking after you, know, like. I'm afraid, I say it again, somewhere between one hundred dollars and $250,000 of surplus cash reserves just sitting idly in some boring bank account, you're getting no, no sympathy or help from me. Suck and it. Think about it. What's going on right now is these baby boomers with their cash surpluses mm -hmm. are supporting their millennial kids. What you're actually going to do is reverse the equation because the millennial kids will be able to borrow all the money. No. They'll have a future that doesn't exist for the others. And they'll just have to help their parents with their 5% loss on their capital, which is doable. But it requires courage. And it might weaken the dollar. For sure, it would weaken the dollar in terms of, uh, depending on, on time frames. But, you know, any weakness in the dollar would, you know, I would set my watch and I would, you know, calibrate the, um, the central banking printing of money. It's foreign exchange intervention. And um, should all of the central banks do this at the same time? No, just ju no, no. It doesn't work that way. Actually, um, it, this is the the divine right of the currency at the centre of the system. Uh, that's, this is why it hasn't worked. And for, well, first of all, they haven't really done it. Within you know, if you go minus twenty basis points, you're a buffoon. You know, you're just boring me. Yeah. You know? 
yeah, I'm not interested. Like, yeah, you want me to be, wow, ooh, 20 basis points, go, you're wasted. Okay. But no, it's the preserve of the reserve currency of the world. The U.S. is the reserve currency of the world because of the the twenty five trillion dollar liquidity of the U.S. Uh, uh, Treasury debt market, uh, and on top of that, the unlimited the unlimited liability uh, the unlimited liquidity provided for by the central bank itself. Um, so there is no liquidity risk in owning uh, U.S. Treasuries, and arguably, I mean there is credit risk, but arguably there's no 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 credit risk, and certainly less credit risk vis-a-vis other nations. So um, the preserve of going negative, the U.S. should be should, like rather than like we discussed uh, with WTO, rather than kind of going down the, the the foolish road of imposing trade sanctions or getting putting grit and sand in the way of trade. Trade's good, but you just got to say, hey, you know, there's a price. There's a price for everything. You got to pay us three percent to hold these treasuries. We're giving you everything else. We're giving you liquidity. You've got no credit risk. We're giving you our customer, our our, our, our consumer, but you know it's going to cost you three percent. And sure. and the next fifty years belongs to us. We're probably going to get fat and complacent on it, and we'll have let's do a time dated stamp in forty years time, and, and we'll switch it around, and we'll be paying you ten, and you'll be making all the money. And what asset do you want to own in this environment? In that environment, where's the optionality? I understand euro dollar hundred strike calls, right? That's a great trade. Because, and, and just to explain to people, euro dollar, I'm talking about the interest rate futures and the 100 strike is, is 0% rates. Because, I mean, they cost a couple of ticks out till December 2022, let's say. Yep. And you could make 100 times your money if it goes to negative 200 basis points. Sure. So that's a trade, right? Bond yields fall a lot. Okay, there's a trade. What, and what else would people do? I presume it, it's gold. And borrow as much money as you can. Yeah, I want to say it's the it's the status quo until. Um, so if that policy, so to answer that question, you have to make an assumption. Does that policy succeed? And and what is success? And I, I think I suggested that success is uh, the need to raise interest rates because the economy is like like really profoundly strong and prices really are credibly taking off. That is um, success. So, but until we pivot and we actually see evidence of that, the trade is still the prevailing trade, which is precious, complex Bitcoin. Um, people always ask me about Bitcoin. Um, I I think I'm going to buy Bitcoin futures. I can't. I just cannot. You I can. I just can't deal with you cranks and your digital safes and guys in Japan stealing my money. I'm, I, I always forget my password. But a future, hey, if it's good enough for Paul Trudeau Jones, it's good enough for Hugh Hendry. You, you saw Stan, you saw Stan yeah. Kamala owns them as well. So futures, oh, yeah. and it's um, the size. You know, yeah. everything now is denominated in Isaac Newton apples. You know, Apple was the first trillion dollar uh, company. The treasury market is 25 apples. The gold market is 10 apples. And the thing about Bitcoin is, what is it? It's, it's, it's just a slice. It's a quarter of an apple. And that's kind of, that's, that's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Um, but to that point, so Bitcoin future, <laughs> gold, silver, um, treasuries, euro dollars, um, r- stocks which are deemed to be riskless security. You see, again, the magic from this thing is I have... Would you believe I, I do keep the company of entrepreneurs? Um, people come. The great thing about St. Bart's is it's a network for really rich, successful folk. Yeah. Some of them are obnoxious. Some of them are just amazing, wonderful. And I've got people with businesses, um, commercial enterprises, which will be flat or up on the year, calendar year, this calendar year. They're paying 8% typically to some hedge fund because the bank won't lend to them. And the hedge was like, wow, yeah, for 8%, maybe. You know, that's idiotic. Okay, in my world, my buddies, I know they're coming to St. Bars, but my buddies are going to lend, get that money at 50 basis points or something, okay? And they're going to just take out all of the shitty competition and take over the world and make it an even better place. That's the, the world that I aspire to living in. Well, let's see how this plays out. I don't, I don't know if you're going to get your world, but 
but I still think we're going to get a negative interest rate world. But I, I do agree that to think our way out of this because of the scarring that it's done to so many people and the issues, as you pointed out, somebody's going to have to make a big change somewhere. And I'm not sure, you know, people are thinking MMT is that a big enough change feels still a bit marginal. Unless, unless you come to me with a $10 trillion number, I don't think it makes a difference. But, you know, it has to be yeah. big. As you said, big and brave. Yeah. M- M- MMT has yet to understand the psychology that you have to change. It's, it's not adding zeros. It, it's actually um, the manner in which you add the zeros. It's the, the front, you know, it's the audacity of what you're trying to do. You're trying to super, you're trying to bring the patient back to life. You know, they're sitting, you know, the, the people that we trust to take responsible risk in our communities don't want to do it. And that's the number one problem. And so we got to kind of boom, you know, resuscitate them. So here's a theoretical question. Sorry, I was... I just thought about that. Is MMT not basically the fiscal version of Hugh Hendry's monetary plan? If you go big enough, you're directing it in certain places. You say the money goes to you, you, and you, which is what you're saying with the monetary. You say I'm going to inject 10 trillion in via the Federal Reserve, via these negative interest rates and whatever, and they're doing it a different way. Are these things the same thing? Are they all part of the same answer? They, Again, they, they're going to hate us. But just assume, I'm going to assume anybody watching this owns gold so they'll be happy. So then we can have a proper argument about it, discussion. I, again, I, I'm just going to repeat myself. Theoretically, yes, and I would be willing to embrace it if I could hear one of the leading proponents actually convince me that they understood um, banking. Because uh, the, the, the key to this is the provision of credit and it, you know, it still does have to go through the channel of banking or credit markets. And, I'm, and so- I'm not sure, Hugh. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it can go direct. That's my point. Is that supposed to lending you money? I could just give you money. But you, at the same time, however, you talk about, you know, digital, Bobby Digital. Do you know there's a, uh, one of the former members of the Wu-Tang, which is a famous, infamous uh, rap. I shouldn't be talking about Bobby Digital. It's a very rude song. Um, but your Bobby Digital notion of you know wanting to play with that, yeah, I just want to come back and say again, the euro dollar market, the thing that just gets no analysis and MMT doesn't look at it. No, no one looks at it, right? Um, you know, because Luke will come back and say, well, the Chinese, you know, they, they've seen you. They're smart. They're not going to buy your treasuries. If you go minus three, the Chinese are leaving the building. And in fact, since 2016 or something, they haven't been buying the treasuries. And, and my repost to that is actually the euro dollar market has not been creating dollars to, ch- to, to channel and, and push into the Chinese leg. It was doing so. It did that from 2000 to kind of 2012. And then it went, ooh. <laughs> it's, the Europe, it's the Europeans and Japanese banks. That was the problem. They just clammed up and went, um, yeah. you're not having any of this. So what I want to say is that there's a kind of there's a kind of dark web of credit creation, which is many multiples greater in size than actually the U.S. government and U.S. banking sector. And yeah. until we kind of actually shine a light on it, work out how they think and and how we can have a dialogue with them, then you're still I, I fear that you're still looking at half measures. I need to go hundred percent in. So let's imagine we now live in a world of a central bank digital currency. So now, because it doesn't have to go through a bank, I can give it to you in St. Bart's and they can give it to me in the Cayman Islands. And so we don't need a euro dollar market. Wow. So, okay. but, so but, there's but, the res- world's reserve currency that actually can control the world's money supply. I don't think we've got time left really to discuss the fractional reserve implications of digital versus the traditional banking model. There may well be a fractional reserve multiplication in that disintermediation that you that you described. But I, if there is, I don't know it as well as I should, perhaps. Mm. Right, it's just something to think about. Hugh, look, thank you as ever to pick your brains on this. I, I just thought it was really interesting because just to challenge the way people think, and again, you're not saying this is what I think, but this is a possible future. And it's the world is about possible futures where the answer is going to come from. Because I damn well know, you damn well know, that doing what we're doing now is not going to change anything. 
they do. So and somebody, then, you know, we have a we have a trade. You know, the, the euro dollar is the essence of macro. Right? It doesn't cost you a lot. It has convexity. You said two hundred times if we got some of these more outlandish predictions of, of mine. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, like your parents were presenting the kids with little Christmas presents under the tree, and we're just saying to unwrap it. Well. Let's see what the future brings. But if it brings anything remotely close to what we're talking about, boom, you know, you're going to enjoy Christmas morning. Absolutely. Hugh, as ever, my friend, great to speak to you. And I'll speak to you very soon. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Thank you all. Hey there, since you got to the end, I'm guessing you liked the video. And that's probably because we don't just turn on a camera and film, we work really hard on getting the narrative flow just right. And that's why many finance companies are actually now hiring Real Vision to make videos for them. One of our recent client videos just hit 100,000 organic views on YouTube, and there were no kittens in sight. So if you want to find out how Real Vision can make a video for your company, just email us at customvideo at realvision.com.